interested to write, and those kids will be, will be brought along in the And then there are the kids who really want to be writers, and I love talking about writing, and those, to those kids, I'm humanizing the process. I'm saying, you can do this. You know, everyone's going to tell you you can't, but it can be done, and it can be done with people who are fairly normal. <laughs> and um, so, so that's marketing for me. And if it sells books, great. It is going to sell books, but it's going to do more than that. Um, so that, that you know, so I'm, I'm constantly involved with ideas for marketing, ideas for publicity, you know, two different things. Um, but it's my subversive way of reaching the kid that I was who never got that. Over the years, and how do you get a pulse of what the kids like for every generation? You've been writing for 25 years. Yeah, for 25 years. Um, there's a bigger change for older kids, for young adults. That, that's been that's been huge um, than it is for what we call middle grade, mm -hmm. which is ages you know eight to 13, right, 12, 13. Uh, for the older kids, um, you know the concerns are different. The dangers in, 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 in life are different. The politics are different. And also, the readership is less patient with being talked down to. I think some of the older books, some of the you know older generations, the, the older young adult books were not really serving them that well. And there's been an explosion in books that really deal with issues that affect these kids. Kids are seeing themselves reflected in the books by really good writers who are able to uh, see them and speak for them. And, and kids now, uh, young adults, which used to be defined as high school and middle school kids, young adults are reading these books up to their 20s and 30s and getting a lot out of them. So it's, 30s. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's, it's 30s. <laughs> it's, it's, you don't look at this. <laughs> it's really. Um, but for middle grade kids, which um, with the Seven Wonders series is, uh, not quite so much. Kids are kids. They're under the they're under the aegis of their parents still, right? Um, I think the difference between younger kids now is they're more impatient and they have more um, distractions. Mm -hmm. they, they're not likely to read a book if after the first page they're bored. Because there are too many other things, you know, the, the handheld devices, the games. There, there are a lot of things, right? But a story is a story, and a compelling story is a compelling story. And you have to try a little harder to, to pull them in and pull them away from something else. But once you do that, you know, you have given them something that they want to do more than some of these other things that are distracting them. So that's it. It's just that it, it's, you as a writer are competing with more things now than you were even five years ago. Yeah, I'm just amazed that you're able to effectively capture your language as well. You know, <laughs> Um, you have two sons, Peter has two sons, one's 22 and one's 25, right? Yeah, that's right. Well, I guess the point is, but the language that you use yeah. really connect with the, with your children, because um, your, your daughter is 11, my, my kids, my two boys are 13, 13 and, uh, 13 and 8, so, and yeah. I know that it's 9. And you, you use the word epic fail. Yeah. How did you hear that? I mean, when? Epic fail. I don't know. You know, there are some things that I just don't. <laughs> I just yeah. figured out. It's like, uh, it's years ago. <laughs> years ago, I wrote books in series for girls, and uh, the publishers would um, would ask me, "How do you know what it's like to be a thirteen-year-old girl?" And I would say, "I don't. I don't. I really don't." Seventeen-year-old girl. That's the kind of Yeah. yeah I, I, you know, I, I don't. I mean, there are some things I don't. I don't question it. I just. Probably yeah. when you're in a train or when you meet kids and you hear how they talk yeah. and you pick it up, right? Because I saw quite a few of, one, of those language views. I, I love it. I, yeah, a big fail. I, I love language. I love language. I, when I hear when I hear a kid say something that I, I haven't heard before, um, my ears always say, "What was that? <laughs> really? That is so cool." I think you know. You know, there's new expressions coming out all the time. You know. And, and I think all of them are so interesting. I, I think that it's, uh, you know, people will, people are appalled at the way language is being abused, but I feel the opposite. I think that, you know. It's evolving. Uh, yeah, it's evolving, and it's, and it's inventive, and it's funny, and uh, I don't know, all of that stuff really, really tickles me. I like it. I think um, more than anything, the language that you use doesn't seem contrived in the It seems to go very naturally. 
Well, I mean, I, 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 I sometimes I try to read my, uh, I try to read my books aloud to myself. And when you read your books aloud, it's a, it's for, for many writers, it's one of the best practices you can do because you hear yourself and you know when it sounds forced. And sometimes you can't tell by reading it, uh, reading it, you know, silently, but by reading, but by reciting it, um, you learn a lot. So that's part of it. And, and the other part is, it's just, it's just you know, you've got to train your ears. Again, I think theater helped with that because you know you're constantly speaking dialogue, and it's good dialogue. Unless it's a bad play, you know, you know right away you can't make it work. So, um, so I, I just think that that's that's been an obsession with me all all my life. It's just it's, just, it's language, playing with language, you know, making sure that whatever comes out of my pen is, um, or actually my, my fingers typing on the keyboard is it sounds real. And if I if it doesn't sound real, I stop and I go back and I agonize over it. And I go back again and again and again. And I just try not to continue until. Until it sounds right. Yeah. Okay, we spoke about writing being a solitary career. Yeah. So at different points in between five years and being an author, I'm sure it was it wasn't just at one point in train station where you wanted to quit. Yeah. Right? So yeah. I'm sure there were many points. So how do you keep going? What what would you find that pushes you off to keep writing and publishing? Actually once I started writing, I, I you know, it was a, it's always been a question of too much work. And in a way that can be just as bad because you never feel like you're done. I mean, I, um, you know, it's been 160 books, and so so there's constantly something there's some, constantly something hanging over my head. And for me, you know, it's it's sometimes it's been not so much you know how how can I how can I think of the next project, but it's um, it's maybe it's time to get off this train. You know, maybe maybe I need to do something else. You know, do. Um, and you know that I find that sometimes, but when I go back and you know and, and get back into the book, and I, usually it's because I'm stuck somewhere. I'm stuck in a plot that isn't working. And then once it gets back going again, it's okay. So I've been, you know, I've been very lucky. I've never really had to struggle with. Um, I have you know an empty point in my life. What was happening with that train trip was that I was stuck ghostwriting, and I thought I was going to spend the rest of my life. You know, writing books that I didn't get credit for, that, um, you know, that, that just, you know, it, it felt like it was starting to feel like it was, it was time to move on. You know. I guess I have just one question before passing over to Wendell. Are there any authors that you really, really respect? Can you share with us, please? Yes. Oh, contemporary authors? Uh, or, or, you know, people like, like that grew up with. Yes. Uh, oh, that I grew up with. All this achieved your writing career over two years. Oh, yeah. yeah. Well, uh, really, the most important thing for me, because of, because I wanted to be a writer when I was a little boy. Really, that's the thing I wanted to do more than anything else. Um, and part of it was because of being the oldest one in my family, and the younger brother and the younger sister, and I had a lot of cousins. We all lived close together. I was the oldest. I was always responsible for the kids. I always had to teach them my homework, but I also had to entertain them. So I grew up as a storyteller because I would tell stories to my cousins to control them. <laughs> and then as I got older, I used to like to uh, I used to like to write them down. And my idea of a good time as a little boy was to close the door in my bedroom, put a pad of paper on the desk, and just let my crazy ideas spill out. And my parents didn't really connect with that because they were were not like that as people. But they understood that that's what was giving me pleasure, and they respected it. And, and I got respect, and that was all I needed, really, uh, from my parents. So when, yeah, recognition for the fact that what I was doing was, was valid and important. So I remember one day, I, was, um, I really liked adventure stories. I liked Jack London. I liked Edgar Allan Poe. I liked Ray Bradbury. I liked Ray Bradbury. And I remember one summer morning, uh, one summer after the evening, in my bedroom, reading uh, To Build a Fire by Jack London, which takes place in the North Pole. And I was worrying about the man and his dog were they going to die from the cold. And it was so, so hot. It was, it was like every day in Singapore, only in New York, <laughs> and, uh, which is unusual. And 
I was feeling so cold because I was reading about the North Pole and I was and it was a hot day and I was thinking to myself, this is this is extraordinary, this is awesome. I feel cold. And I was about, you know, must have been ten years old. And I was so excited I wanted to share this with my father. So I ran downstairs and I burst into the TV room and I was gonna say, Dad, Dad, you won't believe but he was watching a ball game with my uncle. <laughs> And they were so intent on the ball game, and, and you know, and I just thought, I thought, no, if I tell him, it's gonna like, it's it's gonna, I'll lose it, I'll lose the feeling. So I said, dang, dang. <laughs> and I just closed it back in, and I went back up to my room. I finished the story, and I stood there shivering. And I remember kind of sitting there for about a half an hour, and just sort of, sort of mulling over what I had just read. And I remember thinking to myself at that age. This guy made me have this physical reaction just using words, nothing else. No, no visual image, nothing but words. And I thought, that is something I want to do when I grow up. So, that's, so those writers really stuck in my head my, my entire young life. And then as, as I've been writing as a, you know, as a writer, I, I latch on to certain writing. The people that I really have liked a lot lately that have really influenced me are Sharon Creech, uh, M.T. Anderson, who I think is about the most brilliant writer out there, um, and Marcus Suzak, the book thief. Uh, I, I love J.K. Rowling, who doesn't? <laughs> and Rick Riordan also. But um, I draw a lot of inspiration I think, from a lot of different writers that constantly read. Okay, so what's the creative process? I mean, how, how is the creative process different when you write a one-off novel yeah. as compared to a series because yeah. um, the Seven Wonders is a seven-book series. It's, it's hugely different. Um, with the Seven Wonders, as with any series, you you know you're outlining a book. You know you're, thinking, you're writing a book, you're planning a book, but you're also planning a bigger story yes. in, in the arc. And there are certain things that you need to reveal by the time you get to the end. And you've got to hold back uh, in a logical way all of the things that you're revealing so that you're not giving away something in book two that really needs to be given away in five or the whole thing's going to end too soon. Um, and you have to have a reason for doing that. It has to be organic. There's got to be a story that actually does have seven parts to it if you're writing a seven book series. That you, you know, so you, in other words, you are writing a book with seven chapters. And in each chapter, there are sub chapters. But the biggest trick is that at seven points of the book, you, you're, you're ending. You know, it, it, it's, like, it's more like a symphony with seven movements. Each one can be taken on its own and enjoy it. But it really doesn't work completely until you listen to the whole symphony from the beginning to the end. And that's a big trick. It's not easy to do. So it's hard. Writing a series is really, really hard. You've got to spend a lot of time, uh, you know, setting that table properly before you start because you can't get it wrong. Mm -hmm. You know, you're toast if you if you get to the fourth book and you realize you've just blown it. You know, you just uh, haven't done it right. So that's tough. Um, so I like to do one-off books in between series because to me they're so refreshing. You can. Um, it's almost like writing a short story as you written a novel. You can express an idea, you can get in, you can get out, um, and you're done. It's just so much fun. So in between working on the 39 Clues and working on Seven Wonders, um, I wrote a young adult novel uh, called Somebody Please Tell Me Who I Am. It was actually co-written by uh, with Harry Mazur, who is an American author that I really admire. He's a friend of mine. But um, he he had to he had actually had a stroke. So he had to bow out after having written the uh, Outline. Oh, no, just a proposal. That's really interesting. Now, we have the same agent, and this is one of the most admired authors to me that I know. And my agent said, Harry, you know, Harry can't finish this book. What would you think of picking up, picking it, picking it up? And I said, great. So I ended up actually writing the book from his idea, which was another kind of a challenge, right? Because it wasn't really coming from, from me. But, um, but it felt great. Because you know, the 39 Clues was so involving, so complicated, and so many faceted, 
and Seven Wonders was going to be this enormous epic, and uh, so doing one book felt, you know, felt like I'd just, uh, you know, taken a nice, refreshing shower. <laughs> So in um, The Seven Wonders, you're writing the entire series on their own, but in The 39 Clues, there are different authors across the different books, yeah. right? So how do you kind of like keep track of the one storyline amongst yourselves? Do you discuss it? No, we never, we never discuss it. That's kind of uh, forbidden. And well, not, not, you know, explicitly, but if one writer uh, called another and said, hey, you know, I'm going to change such and such. Well, there are seven writers in the series, and it, it's possible that one of the writers won't know that. And when that writer is, is writing his or her book, if they don't have that piece of information, it's, it's very, very tough. So we never talk about the, we never even talk about the books one another. We never uh, talk to our editor. I mean, you know, it's kind of like a, you know, I, I think of it as, as 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 airplanes coming into an airport, right? At the same time, you know, they don't call one another. It's like one pilot doesn't call the other and say, "Hey, Jim, you go first. No, 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 you go first. You know, they, 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 they contact the air traffic control and they make sure everybody gets in. So our editor was like our air traffic controller. We, if any, even the slightest change. So you refer to your editor. Mm -hmm. And then the editor makes sure that everybody finds out. Okay. So still with the series, do you write with the ending in mind or do your characters surprise you before? Well, I write, I write with the ending, but I don't always get there the because the characters do surprise. So I, I, I'm always aware that that may happen, and um, and it does. You know, sometimes sometimes you'll completely. Let's face it. If you plan something and something better comes along, why not? And that's uh, that's that's what that's what generally happens. Is something happens in the in the, in the writing of the book, and um, you know, I, I say, well, <laughs> how come I never thought of that in the first place? But it doesn't matter. You know, you think about it when the character brings it out of you. So lately there has been a preponderance of group protagonists in YA in middle grade novels. So you have the mysterious benefit society series with a group of kids. You have the pseudonymous Walsh secret series also a group of children. So what makes uh, Marco, Ali, Cass, and Jack stand out? Maybe it would be a good time to have the others hear about the characters. Yeah, yeah. well, okay, so um, four kids, Jack, Ali, Marco and Cass. Uh, the protagonist of the series is Jack. Uh, they find themselves on a desert island. I don't know why they're there. Uh, you know, they blacked out and they woke up on this island. And it turns out that each of them has something that no one else has. It's a gene that they've inherited from the royal family of the ancient civilization of Atlantis. What this gene does is it takes whatever you're good at, whether it be music or, or computers or sports, right? And it turns, it magnifies it. It turns it into a kind of a superpower. But no one who has had this gene has ever lived past the age of 14. So all of these kids are 13. And here on this island, there's a laboratory where they found a cure. And in order to be cured, these kids have to find seven objects that were taken centuries ago from the ancient civilization of Atlantis and hidden in each of the seven wonders of the ancient world. The ancient wonders were made to house these objects. If they can find these objects and bring them back to the island, they will be cured and they will also save the world. But of course, the big problem is six of the seven wonders of the ancient world no longer exist. This is a huge problem <laughs> that they have in the series. Um, I don't know why other authors um, have groups of kids, but I think um, I like the idea of a group of kids because kids are constantly trying to understand themselves in the context of a larger group. This is the age where you're starting to pass from, um, you know, identifying with your parents primarily to identifying with your peers. You haven't quite gotten past that 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 hump uh, where where teenagers have, young adults have. You know, they are primarily interacting with their peers as opposed to their parents. So it's really important for kids to understand themselves with, you know, in the context of other people. And kids are doing it all the time. Or the readers are doing it all the time. And one of the things that really attracted me to this particular group was um, three of them have really obvious talents. And the fourth doesn't. And in fact has convinced himself 
that because the other kids are so talented, so powerful, that there's something wrong with him. That there's obviously that that he's not he's 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 the misfit. He's a mistake. He you know he he was chosen for no particular good reason. He feels inferior. And I think that most kids feel that way. I know for me, um, I was always convinced that there was that there was somebody better than me. And it's true. No matter who you are, there's always going to be somebody better than you in something. You know, most of the things that you do, you're going to find somebody better. And as adults, we assimilate that. We understand that. You know, you sort of make peace with it. You're, you're not going to be the best in everything. But kids don't quite get that. They, they think that they are nothing because other kids are something. And that's what I want to explore, too, you know, psycho psychological evidence in these books. Could you provide us with just a little bit of a teaser about what to look forward to the upcoming second or third book? Well, the second, <laughs> the second book. Just a teaser, not an update. No, the uh, teaser or not is an update and spoiler. Right? Yeah. Um, the second book is called uh, Lost in Babylon. So I'll let you guess which of the seven wonders of that <laughs> involves. I won't tell you, but it hangs and it's a garbage. Oh. <laughs> um, uh, so it's very, uh, boy, really to, to tell you anything about it would, uh, <laughs> would, would, be, would, be a, would be a spoiler. But I mean, each of these books is um, one of the seven wonders, and that each of these books involves some kind of uh, awesome way of accessing that seven wonder. And this one is going to be wild. It's, it's going to be absolutely, absolutely wild. And I, I'm, uh, I'm praising Ray Bradbury as I write this one because he was so imaginative and I'm using him as an inspiration. My daughter loves Ray Bradbury. Yeah, do you pick him? We read him all the way. Some of the short stories, the illustrated short stories. Yeah, yeah. Dandelion. 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 Dandelion.